What is up, Aspire Leaders? Happy weekend to you. Before we begin our conversation with the talented Star Saxian, who's been on the podcast a couple times, I wanted to let you know of an exciting announcement for the podcast. So with that, I'm thrilled to announce the newest title sponsor of the Aspire to Lead podcast is S'more. As an administrator, I constantly face the challenge of effective communication with my parents and my community. The biggest question that always came up was, are our school newsletters going unread? Well, let me introduce you to S'more, the ultimate newsletter creator specifically built for educators and our leaders. And this is a service my school used for years, and it was absolutely brilliant. S'more is incredibly easy to use with customizable templates. You can add text, images, videos, links, and even polls. S'more's detailed analytics show you exactly who opens your emails and which links get clicked, so you can stop guessing and start knowing what's working. And my favorite tool in S'more is that it actually translates the newsletter into more than 100 languages, which is so fantastic for our multilingual families. This platform is beautiful, effective, and simple. So the question is, are you ready to elevate your newsletter? Head over to s'more.com slash teach better and get $50 off your first year of any s'more subscription plan. Let's make sure your school communication gets the attention it truly deserves. Now let's head over to our conversation with Star Saxteen as she has a brand new book out. Like I said earlier, she's been on the podcast before and we discussed a previous book, Hacking Assessment. But today, this accomplished educator, author, and advocate is really looking to help educators who feel stuck in their role, maybe burnt out, looking for a change, and assisting in finding what the best path is for their future. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire to Lead, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. All right, Aspire Leaders and Teach Better Family, we are back once again this week, and I have one of my favorite guests that it honestly should be yearly. We should have an annual conversation with my fantastic guest, Star Saxton, and she has written a brand new book, Making an Impact Outside the Classroom, and so excited about this resource and diving into this topic. But before we do that, Star, how have you been? It has been too long, my friend. I think August of 2022 was the last time we talked. Yeah, it's a lot has happened. I feel like there's time now. I feel like once you get past 40, time is like a speed warp of just sure. like you close your eyes and then one month becomes four months, becomes six months, a year, two years. And then it's like, oh my God, where did the time go? But things have been really, really good. I live in Florida now, which is unique and different than New York. Yeah. Was ready to leave New York, but I'm still adjusting to Florida. We moved when my son graduated and he's in college now. He's in his second year. So that was an interesting transition. Being an empty nester now is really, really different. We got two kittens. So, you know, was, yeah, it was like time to get some more young things that needed to yes. be <laughs> Not empty nester anymore. You've got two cats. That's right. Which makes it just a little bit more, to, like more challenging to travel and kind of lean into the situation of being at home. We've done some renovations on the house, which has been really, really nice. So it's a place we want to be all the time now. It's kind of nice. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah, Star, when you moved to Florida, we moved to Colorado and I'm shaking my head because yes, after 40 time flies. And I think last year, honestly, felt like the fastest year of my life. <laughs> it went by so quick. Um, to say that we've been here for years, crazy. Star, will you just share a little bit? I know, you know, in previous episodes and, and for those who are listening, please go back and listen to Star's wonderful interviews in, in the past. But would you just kind of give us an update to where you are professionally? Sure. So I am still the COO at Mastery Portfolio, and we're basically a small ed tech company that helps schools move to mastery learning, specifically focusing on everything that gets you up to the point where you're thinking about your grading and all the things. But it, it, it's really also just like the way we think about learning in general, what that looks like, helping schools move in that direction. We coach teachers, we coach leaders on how to make change in your space. My background is obviously assessment mostly. So earlier this year, I had the opportunity to share um, student-led assessment with ASCD, which was like the last installment of all the pieces of hacking assessment really spelled out. And that focuses on student-led conferences and portfolio work. 
as well as a foundation of a really strong formative assessment process where kids are involved. And the new book, Making an Impact Outside the Classroom, is a complete and total departure from all the stuff that I've done before. I, I think over the years, I've heard teachers say so frequently, I'm just a teacher. And that phrase is something that is very upsetting to me because I have never met a teacher who is just anything, honestly. So when the opportunity came, I want to say like a year and a half ago, ISTE had their little, I think it was called Aspire little webinar or half a day conference where I was invited to speak on a panel because my career has sort of done this a whole bunch, kind of taken these alternative routes and you know, where I've wound up where I am now in a consulting space and in a writing space. A lot of people always ask me, how did you get to where you are? And so it got me thinking, you know, maybe other people who are having some challenges in the classroom right now, they need to understand their worth and their value. And that just because you haven't done something else doesn't mean you're ill prepared to do something else. So the book is all about like embracing your strengths, the things you love most about being in schools and different places you could apply that. If you need a break, like I kind of think of it as a love letter in the introduction and the conclusion, I speak about potentially going back to the classroom myself. I think it's one of those, it's like a dream in the back of my head, I think to some degree that one day I'll find myself in a high school English classroom again or a journalism classroom. And because that's really where I was the happiest, I think. But post COVID, obviously, there's a lot of challenges and I think people just need a break whether that means going back to school and becoming a you know, guidance counselor and just doing something else in a school or getting your leadership credentials and moving in that direction or just going in a different direction altogether and applying the skills you've acquired over the years to a different setting. And one of my favorite parts of writing the book was I have a playlist that goes with it on YouTube of about 13 interviews I did with ed educators who left education to do other things. And so if, while you're reading, you're interested in one of those job titles, you could listen to one of the interviews with one of those folks. And I don't know, it was so much fun to tap into my journalism background and kind of really hear people's stories, why they left, what they love about their new job and how being an educator really prepared them to do the things they're doing. Man, Star, there's so many wonderful things that you've talked about about this book and how unique it is. I love one that you're leaning into people's strengths, because I think most people, you know, when they're buying a book, they're thinking about how to improve my weaknesses. The second part is just the fact that it's okay to step away. And if you come back, great. Or maybe you fall in love with something else that you found is now a passion and something where your strengths can better yourself and others um, through that profession. So um, I think that's something also, I think, you know, just in education, when I started talking about leaving, it was like, no, can't do that. You have to stay, you have to be a lifer, you have to retire here. For me, it was like, no, I, I feel like in my profession right now, where I am, it's time, it's time for me to step away. And maybe like you start, I eventually I go back. But right now, like, I'm happy. <laughs> so, you know, why, why wouldn't I do that? And I love that you're at least giving folks permission to say if it is a time for you and your journey to be able to step away. Well, to that end, Josh, since you're also not in that space anymore, like when did you know it was time? A year prior to when I did it. Yeah. 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 I don't know. It was just one of those things. I, I felt like I just needed something different. Me and you, before we push record start, I know you're like this too, is that I like to have my hands on a lot of different things, right? Mm -hmm. So I was an administrator. I was writing my book. I had a podcast. I was working with Teach Better. You know, like there were a lot of things I was already doing, but I just was more fulfilled with some of these other side projects that I had where I was like, well, I want to do this full time, you know, or speaking too. It was one of those other things. I love boarding staff members and districts and traveling and going to help educators and whatever they need. I just found great joy in that and figured I might as well lean into that since it made me happy. Right. Sometimes it also feels like there's a moment that you have. Like I remember when I first wrote Hacking Assessment and all of a sudden folks were like, oh, we read Hacking Assessment. Do you come to schools? And I was still in right. the classroom when that happened. And a lot of it, too, was other New York City public schools. So it was a, a direct conflict of interest for me to engage with other schools in the system. 
I ended up doing a lot of free work. It's like they read my book, they bought my book. So if I could jump on, this is, I'm going to date myself right now. I jumped on Skype with these, with these folks, like, you know, they want to know how, how do I integrate this in my space too? And since we lived in the same system, I was able to be like, well, you know, these were the ways I was, are we, you know, able to get around the specific things that you're talking about? And this was the pushback that I got from my colleagues. This was the pushback I got from my principal. So, I mean, it there did come a time where I, I reached a critical mass where it was like, I could probably do this full time. Enough people are asking at this point. And I would say that by the time I had left the classroom, I had already published, I want to say, four or five books. I had done my TED Talk. I had done a lot of the bucket list kind of things. And you, I don't know that I would have left the classroom except for the fact that my son was going through his own personal challenges at that time. And I needed to get closer to home and an opportunity to apply for a job that I, on paper, wasn't necessarily qualified to do. Like I didn't have my leadership credentials yet, but I was certain that I could do the job well. And so I applied for it and said, you know, what do I have to lose? I'll put in my cover letter that I don't have my license, but I'll go for it and we'll see what happens. And ultimately, because there was no pressure, because I had, I actually had no belief that I would get this job just because in New York, you generally need the credentials to be able to do all the things. The unions are pretty strong. And so like people would have a problem with a non-licensed administrator being in that space. And after my first interview, they were like, how fast can you get your license? So it was, I ended up getting a job. I thought I had no business. Like I knew I could do it, but I didn't think I could do it um, legally. And I ended up doing it for two years. And there started the, <laughs> the parade of what came thereafter. So you never know. You never know where life's You never going. know. Nope. It's true. I want to talk about the interviews that you conducted on YouTube. Um, sure. I know that's associated with your book, but I'm curious. I mean, obviously doing the podcast, I, I've had the opportunity to speak to hundreds of people, but yeah. I'm curious with the 13, kind of with that overarching umbrella of outside the classroom and how they're making an impact. Was there mm -hmm. any like single thread through the 13 that you found? I would say that most folks, like you suggested, they started to feel like they they weren't getting the same kind of joy in the space that they were in anymore. And some people wanted to stay within their school community in different capacities. So like within those interviews, there are some people who are consultants. Connie Hamilton is one of them. So she talks about her whole journey. And she actually also wrote the forward for the book. And then like there were other folks who there was one person I spoke to who's now a superintendent of, of the correctional facilities in um, Massachusetts. And like, it was, fan it was really interesting to think about how education plays a role in different environments and how they were trying to help with the recidivism issues that were happening at that point and using education as a means to keep folks incarcerated doing the right thing and making their lives better. And so that was a really interesting conversation. I spoke with a gentleman who unfortunately experienced some loss in his own family. And because of his own trauma with losing a child, he became a speaker who goes into schools to talk about drug addiction with students and finds a lot of joy and passion in that work now as well. So sometimes it was a life experience that forced them out. Sometimes it was that it was just time for a change kind of thing. And then you had other folks super inspired about something specific. Like I, I spoke with Chris from, I get the, the name of their, their organization wrong all the time. They do the human-centered learning in their nonprofit. So he talked a lot about creating the nonprofit and how, you know, both he and his partner, Nick, like stayed in school as long as they could until the job was sustaining enough to become this thing that they could both do full time. So I think it's it's really, they're good to listen to. I mean, if you're somebody who's interested in building your own nonprofit, that one really centered around that experience. I've spoken to like a curriculum coordinators, 
guidance counselors. I spoke to one person who worked in a nonprofit also for about 10 years, but was an educator in New York before that. I love listening to people's stories. Like there's something about that that I find really fascinating. Who knows, like maybe I should have been a sociologist in some some way, like we're just hearing people's stories is something like the thread of life that connects us all and finding those touch points that make each of our experiences a little bit more interconnected. So I just thought it was an interesting addition to a book. Like when I had, when I had mentioned it to my publisher, I was like, I think it would be really cool since yeah. I did this survey if I actually interviewed some of these people and went into depth on some of these different jobs. Yeah, no, I love the idea. And maybe that's what led you to journalism too, is the connection to people and getting their stories. To start, I'm going to pause for just a moment, but I want to link it to what we're talking about because when I made the shift into kind of the entrepreneur world with Teach Better, small business, being an author, being a speaker, all those kinds of things, I also made some major changes in my life as far as health. And so one, I had to move as quickly to Colorado and get into the mountains for that healthy life. But also I changed my diet. I also use um, the sponsor here, Magic Mind, um, which is a mental performance shot. And I use it every single day. I have the subscription monthly. So it comes to my door. I can cancel anytime. And there's a money back guarantee for that. But for the month of October, and I'm going to put this on the screen for everyone who's watching on YouTube, you can go over to magicmind.com slash aspiredly40. And that actually will get you 40% off of your subscription. And there's a lot of different subscription models. So you don't have to get 30 like me. And I get a large pack that gets delivered every month. But you can get a smaller amount. Highly recommend the subscription. It is an amazing product. And one that has a lot of natural ingredients. I know when I was an administrator, it was extremely unhealthy. I was grabbing everything I possibly could from the front office, which was donuts, coffee, sugar, candy, whatnot, where this is all natural. It's got natural ingredients. And really what it does is it increases your working memory, it enhances your mood. I mean, there's a lot of benefits here, boosts endurance. It also fights fatigue and also enhances your immune functions, which is huge when you have six kids, when they bring home stuff all the way from elementary, middle and high school into my house. So it's good for my immune system. I've said before, when I've gotten ill, I feel like every time I take Magic Mind, I feel a little bit better. So head over to magicmind.com slash aspired lead 40. And then in the uh, checkout, use aspired lead 40 in the code. That'll get you 40% off just for the month of October. So I want to make sure that you are getting as much money off as possible. Love this product. Highly recommend it. All right, Star, I want to go back to what we were talking about with your book. And I know for those who maybe are having similar feelings, right? I mean, we've mm -hmm. talked about a lot of that as far as maybe they're not finding joy in what they're doing. Maybe they feel like, you know, I'm itching to get out and do something different in my life professionally. What are some pieces of advice for them when they're feeling this way within their own profession? Actually, in the first or second chapter, we kind of, I, I dig right in to thinking about how you know when it's time to go and then where to start looking. And part of that is about clarity. I think that a lot of times we might not be excited about where we are, but we aren't sure what we want to do next. And so we have this holding pattern of like, until I have a very safe place to go, I don't want to take a huge risk because we have family obligations. We have other kinds of financial obligations. It's really hard when you're a middle-aged person with a lot of responsibilities to leave a very consistent, safe and secure job. Education is such a secure job. You know, you've got benefits, you've got probably decent pay, you have really good vacation time. There's lots of great things that kind of get built in there. So you are definitely taking a risk. And one of the activities that I say folks should do at the beginning, which someone recommended to me um, a long time ago, is to write the job description of what you want. So like kind of thinking about what do I love most about my job? What don't I like about my job? Where would I be interested in growing? And then what is the title I want? Start with that. What does my job description look like? Um, what would my day-to-day -day activities be? Who would I be interacting with? And really create like a really comprehensive job description with a schedule and then when it comes time for you to start looking, you have a much better idea of what you're actually looking for. And then at least if you have to be in that holding pattern in the, your current job, you have a very clear direction of where you're going and probably a much more 
a higher likelihood of finding what you want. And maybe even you could bring that job description to your boss at work and say, hey, you know, I'd like to be a part-time instructional coach, which is something I actually did before I left the school I was at the longest. And I was, I was like, you know, I would love to mentor the new teachers in the building and have like a shortened schedule so that I could work with them and also maintain a model classroom. Like I thought that would have been really awesome. And the job that I got right after that one was actually an instructional coaching position that was just that, where I still taught three classes a day, but I was running the teacher center and I was coaching other teachers. And that one turned out to be my favorite in school position. So I think sometimes just doing that clarity work for yourself is the best thing you could do to make a good best choice. But to go back to that idea of giving yourself permission, it's also okay to try something. And if it doesn't work out, you don't have to stay for another whole lifetime. You could decide that you took a risk, stay until it's not the right fit anymore, and then move on. And it's a lot easier to move on when you haven't been in a space for like 10 or more years. I, I found that after I left the long, the long job, losing <laughs> yeah. all the, you know, leaving all the subsequent ones was a lot easier. I appreciate that you're saying that you found your strengths and then you also had the courage to go in and ask because it can't hurt to ask. And then if they do build the position that you dream of, you're going to be so much happier <laughs> moving forward, but also it's, it's going to fall in line with the strengths and your passions and your love. And I've done that before too. I, you know, when I was kind of in my darkest time, as far as administrator, not enjoying the job, I kind of had to go back to my why. Why did I do it in the first place? And then I started to write on my board just like these lines of why I was in this job. And then I started to look at what were the projects and things that I was in charge of that fell in line with those. And what I realized was nothing fell in line with those at that time, which was why I was so melancholy about it. Yeah, I was down. So then I was, okay, what can I build to then fall in line with those, which is my passion, is my love. This is why I did the job in the first place. And once I started to build those programs and get the permission to do those, that's when I started to become happier in the job. Yeah. Well, I mean, now you're doing some stuff that's so different. You're a perfect example of like folks have, who have also sort of followed their own path. Like, so yes. you made that first step, right, to get to the next job. What was it like when you left the school-based job to do what you're doing now? Like, how did you know that was the right time? Well, similar to what you were talking about with that interview where they did the nonprofit, right? I, I had dipped my toes in all these different things. And then when I felt like I was able to sustain it where I wasn't going to be at ground zero, I had already built something <laughs> to, to lean on where I wasn't going to fail my wife and my children <laughs> with the transition. I felt like I was stable enough to be able to, to move on to, into that world. So it was one of those things where I wanted to experience it to see if I loved it and liked it. And once I did, then it was about building up something that was sustainable and to make that pivot for myself. I just felt like that was the responsible thing to do. And then also, also, I think it made it just a smoother transition. Well, I mean, going back too to what you were saying before, even in your little advertisement, when we think about the things that make us more focused in the work that we're doing and the things that, you know, like there's still so much learning to be done, regardless of what role that you're in. And like, getting to that place and then making determination, like these are the things that I like. The, the one thing that about a post COVID world is you can do a lot of different things totally. and make your own schedule and have those flexible hours and still have, you know, all the bells and whistles that you could possibly want. And I think sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And when you've been in a teaching gig for a really long time, the world changes outside a lot more than you realize because things inside schools don't really change all that much. You know, change is very slow <laughs> in, yes. in the educational world, which is very different from outside of that. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. No, there's a lot to think about here, Star, for, for those who are listening. And I want to talk about a couple more things that you're doing. I know you talked about the ASCD presentation, and I know it's in line with the book. So do you mind just sharing a little bit more about that presentation? Because I know you speak all over the country and you do keynotes and a whole host of things. Yep. So at the ASCD Leadership Summit, which is sadly the last ASCD Leadership Summit, it's going to be in Nashville on Saturday that I think it's October like 
is it the 19th or the week after? I don't know. And it's a session about making an impact, but I really want it to be more of a workshop. So folks are going to come in, hopefully, who are in that place where they're kind of itching to do something else. And I'm hoping that by the end of the session, they will all have created their ideal job. going to walk them through the process of building the job that they want and then decide, you know, helping them think about where they might go out to seek those kinds of jobs. I'm, I'm also kind of hoping that while I'm in there, I had the opportunity recently to take over a column in the Cap'n magazine from PDK called Career Confidential. And it's kind of like Dear Abby for educators. So people write in and they tell me what challenges they're having right now. And then I answer, I help them with those issues. And so I'm hoping that maybe in that session, I have an opportunity to listen to some of the challenges folks are having and get their permission to use them in the column. The the column's all anonymous. I would never use people's information in any way, like unconnected. Like this, this week's post is all about student motivation, which anybody who's working in a consulting role understands teachers have been struggling since COVID because kids are are legitimately different than they used to be. I mean, I think we've all been like, yeah, kids are different now, but kids kids are actually different now. Like I think biologically and psychologically different than they were before COVID. And so teachers have a job in front of them in just getting kids to engage. That was the challenge that I, I tried to tackle a little bit in, in this week's column. That's awesome. And so for those who are watching on YouTube, I, I threw up the link for the ASCD Leadership Summit, and it's going to be October 18th through the 20th in Nashville. I, I am a little sad to hear you say that's going to be the last leadership conference, but I, I think it'll give some folks some motivation to, to get out there for that wonderful event. Yeah, I'm, I'm sad too. I think since the ASCD is the merger, things are just changing. So this is the last of the smaller ASCD alone leadership summits. I don't know what will come after. All right, Star, I want to just mention too, you've got a phenomenal podcast that you're part of and you're on the Teach Better Podcast Network, which I'm so proud to have you all on. So, mm-hmm. you know, if they want to hear more of you, more about, you know, all the wonderful things that Mastery Portfolio is doing, we just share out about uh, learner-centered spaces? Sure. So Crystal Frommert and I um, host Building Learner-Centered Spaces. And essentially, we talk to folks about how we build these paradigms in classrooms. How do we put kids in charge of their learning? It's very conversational, very short. We kind of follow the lead of our guest. So although we have the same questions we ask every time, sometimes someone will say something that just sends us in a totally different direction and we follow that direction. And it's made for some really interesting conversations. We've spoken to folks at every kind of level of education. A few months ago, we actually even had one with students. My son was on it and so was her niece. And we talked about how kids feel about being in learner-centered spaces and what that looks like and feels like for them also. And I just, I think there are lots of people doing really awesome things that are all about kids who don't take the opportunity to share those things with other people. And you don't have to be somebody who's written enough books to have an Amazon page of your own to be someone worth listening to. And I, I used to say this to folks too with blogging way, way back in the day when, you know, when I was blogging for Ed Week and blogging was a big thing, like when it was just becoming a big thing. And people are like, why would I even want to blog? I was like, people care about your story and only you can tell your story the way you can tell it. So, you know, it's about having that confidence to share as much of yourself as you're comfortable sharing in a space. And the podcast is like that too. No, it's so true. I mean, I, to be honest though, Star, I felt the same way when I was asked for the first time to be a guest on a podcast. I was like, who am I to, to be a guest? Uh, Cause you know, at that time I was, I felt like similar to the statement that you said before, right? I'm just a teacher. I was just an administrator. And, um, but that's not true. That's, you know, Thankfully, the the host was like, no, you have great value to share. Please get on. And that's the same, you know, for, for anyone out there that's listening. That your voice is important. Your experience, the wisdom that you have is important. So if you have an opportunity to blog, you have an opportunity to jump on a podcast, build your own podcast, goodness, um, make sure you're doing that because a lot of people would benefit from just like what Star was talking about. Star, I want folks to connect with you in every possible way. So mm-hmm. how, how would they do that? What would be the easiest way? 
The easiest way on LinkedIn, it just star saxing on LinkedIn. My email is Ms. Saxing at gmail.com. And then basically my website, Ms. Saxing.com. So every, everything is branded Ms. Saxing with the exception of Instagram. And I think my Instagram <laughs> was always like more of a personal space. So it's sure. not that, I mean, if you like watching cat videos and seeing pictures of cats and kids and travel pictures, then come visit me on Instagram. But most of my work stuff trickles through the website and LinkedIn. And I have a love-hate relationship with X now, but platform- Don't we all. Twitter. <laughs> you know, you develop, I, I spent years developing that audience and spending so much time in chats and doing all these things. And now I have this beautiful audience that I don't want to fail, but at the same time, I find myself on that platform less and less. LinkedIn seems to be the safest, most- yes professional space to be on. So if folks don't want to go directly to email, you could reach me through my website or through LinkedIn. And that's probably the best way. Well, I love you on Instagram too. I love, you know, especially when you go to Colorado and seeing the trips that you go on. And also, I mean, you were talking about your son going to college, which mm -hmm. blew me away. I almost fell over because I feel like when we first started talking to you, it was like just any middle school, maybe getting into high school, like uh -huh. <laughs> time has flown, my friends. Goodness. Well, I love talking with you, sir. I, I appreciate you Always. being on once again on Aspired Lead. And I just appreciate your friendship, who you are as a person, how you're assisting educators, and just the love letter that you've created in this brand new resource and book. For those who are interested in the book, I'm going to have the link for you to be able to purchase that uh, through the show notes. So if you go over to joshsamper.com, you know, you can get information as far as connecting with Star. You also get the information about the book. Also, if you're heading over to YouTube, um, it'll be in the description there over on my channel, Joshua Stamper. And then also be on the Teach Better YouTube channel, which is a growing community. So make sure you're subscribing to both of those. And with that, Star, it was so much fun once again to catch up. And I appreciate you so much. Back at you.